Hey everybody, good morning. Thanks for hanging out today. Um, random way to adapt. That was actually really fun when you see a, an entrepreneur have to sit here and panic and, and tell a story through when things aren't working. It's really, it's good, it's good to see. Um, so I'm in that uh, sort of style. I am, how many people in here love PowerPoint presentations? Love them, awesome, that's exactly what I was hoping. <laughs> I am not going to do one. In fact, uh, what is going to come up on the screen is nothing but imagery. It's just going to hope, I want you to sort of focus on the story. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about, carbon-based fertility, is something that takes up semesters of time. It's not a 15-minute topic, so we're just going to sort of tell a story. First of all, another show of hands, I need a little bit of participation here. What well, This is the lead, very simple question. How many people have heard that term, carbon-based fertility? Okay, we have a few. Now, of those hands that are up, do you know what it is? A couple, few in the front. So here's what we're going to do. I'm just going to take you on a little bit of a journey, and let's, uh, let's see if this works out. And I'm going to step down here to do it. I think it's important to talk about, first of all, the history of fertilizer in general, and where we are as an industry right now, um, and where our information came from to begin with. And I'm going to go way back and start with Cato the Elder. First person who wrote about agriculture, tending for the soil, uh, how to do composting, how to properly fertilize, cover crop, rotate, uh, use of animal manure, how to truly see like digestible uh, nutrients in play. Everything was written, this was in 200 BC. So we consider this sort of like the father of of really modern agriculture even now. This is 2200 years old and we're running off of these practices. So as we sort of fast forward through time, there was a method that was done. There was not a lot of readily available materials, not nutrients like we have them now. We couldn't run down and grab a bag of something. Everything had to be created. Potash was boiled away and burned plant material and spread across the field. There was already the use of the ash out in these fields with manures for nitrate. It wasn't until you moved into the middle, say, 13, 14, 15th century where you started to hear about saltpeter, and this had to do with gunpowder. It was noted that at that time there was fertility aspects to this uh, potassium nitrate where it was, if it was spilled on a field, plants seemed to grow a bit more robust. Okay, this is just something that started to happen with natural elements. Moving further, a little further in time, uh, potash wasn't really starting to get mined until around the 14th, 15th century. We didn't really know what phosphorus was until about the 15th century as well. This is all stuff that we use on a regular day-to-day -day basis. Okay, our regular NPK stuff. Coming into the late 19th century and into the early 20th century, uh, there was a major conundrum, and, and it was brought up a little bit ago about uh, population of people outpacing the amount of food that could possibly be produced based on the way agriculture was working, okay? Now notice I have not really spoken much about turf yet because we haven't really gotten it. This is still developing. We're coming through agriculture and setting the framework for where we are in business today. So around that time, global population was going up. This is pre-World Wars. The focus and the concern, the League of Concerned Scientists said, how are we going to feed all these people? We need to figure out how to produce more crops. Then came the production of commercial nitrogen through the Haber-Bosch process. It changed the world for all of us. Many of us are here and alive today just because of that invention, because people were able to be fed and the population grew. Okay, so now there was commercially available nitrogen, and this is early 20th century. So through the events of the time and, and uh, the wars, that, that machinery was used for a lot of different things, mainly munitions. After the war, there was a surplus of nitrogen, and there was a way to move that out into the agricultural field, and there was shown that there was a boost. There was a boost in crop production. Now everybody's going to be fed, and the world now had more of an abundance than there were really ever going to be. We're still producing more food than there are people, although there is still starvation in the world. Coming up into about the 1950s, lawn care really started to become a thing when we started to create suburbs and that urban sprawl and move into sort of the golden age of lawn care, which would have been the late 70s, 
yeah, early 80s as things were developing and growing. What we started to get was an adoption of the agricultural method of NPK fertilization into our day-to-day -day spread it and forget it mentality. But up until that point, the care of the soil was paramount. It was noted that years and years and years, and if you go and you travel in um, Europe and go back to these old, the old country and see these continuously used farm ground or see these 2,000 year old olive trees and things, places like that that are still going, it was attending to the ground that happened. And it happened through the manures and the ash and these other materials that were more of a slower breakdown, more soil tending, soil first effort. Everybody with me so far? Just telling a nice story. So, as with everything in lawn care, we have adapted from agriculture. It's all come off of agriculture. Some of the best chemicals that have come along were over here, and then they were given to us on this side. It's like it works it's super concentrated here, we get a little weaker version, but we keep getting everything handed down from ag, including the information about how much and how many nutrients are to go out onto the turf. Now, here's where I have to go back just a little bit up. One of the interesting things that happened is when this commercially available nitrogen began to come out, began to be readily available, most of the farmers didn't want it because they had a way of doing things. They already were set up. I know how to did it, my daddy did it, my daddy did it, my daddy did it. This is how we did it, this is how it's gonna be. And it took a little while, it's about a 15 year transition to have real like commercially available nitrogen out into fields and see these massive crop productions. So there was a huge boost of food for a while. And then it leveled off and it sort of dropped a bit. And then there was another huge boost of food after the genetics started to come into play. And, and there were hybridization of crops and things like that. So that was the next big push to increase productivity. <clears throat> However, we have to talk about that level off for a second. Because one of the things that happens with a conventional nitrogen source that is going out and being put down regularly and often is that there is a certain energy aspect that has to go towards that nitrogen that gets used and pulled by the soil, by soil life, and that's this sort of cycle, about 30% of what you're putting down is going to feed the bacteria. Well, because there was a sort of organic and robust soil system, those bacteria were so stimulated by that nitrogen, there was a force of growth into every plant. Everything was being pushed a lot harder until we started to see that organic matter start to go away. Iowa State has been doing continuous studies on a particular field where they have not tilled, have not treated, have not done anything to it. I think they're like 87 years in or something now. And showed that that compared to their tilled and tended fields, the, the tilled and tended fields have lost about 43% of the carbon in the soil compared to what's been left alone. That's saying something because the practices are sound. It's what's being taught. The tilling, the feeding, the turning, the cropping, all of that stuff, but compared to being left alone, but we're seeing carbon loss, okay? There is an effect, an atmospheric effect. When you see a plant, and the reason that I just wanted to have imagery up here, this is something for you to think about. A plant is truly a physical representation of things that are sort of intangible for us. It's air and it's sunlight coming into a physical form that we can touch and eat and actually enjoy. This, plants are just these things we can't really grab onto, forming into a physical form. And when they die and they decay, they leave their carbon, their bodies behind to tend back to the soil so that their offspring can continue to grow. Nature has a way of finding a balance, an equilibrium that we do not. Because as human beings, we're here to tend to this land. We come in we find it, this is grass and this is ag, it's all gonna fit together. We have to come out, we have to cut it, we have to trim it. We have to feed it, we have to water it, we have to do this, 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 and this. And your crop, your grass, becomes trained to be a certain way based on how you treat it. Is everybody with me? This is true. It will be trained on a certain way. If you stress grass out long enough, it learns how to handle stresses better. If you overfeed it, it grows at such a high rate, it needs to get rid of. You've got all of these things. If you just watch your methods, that's what's happening. So, what we've been doing me personally, and, and how I've kind of come to where I am today, is focusing on the carbon-based side. Because carbon really works as a glue. 
Here's this sort of sticky element that's out there just grabbing onto things, bringing it in, holding itself like a sponge. If you were to take a gram of ash or even a gram of shale, it's so porous, if you could flatten that out, you wouldn't be able to see it, but it would cover about 10,000 square feet in this gram because there's so much porosity inside one of these, just this small elemental item. So when we start to focus on fertility and look at carbon-based fertility, your, your methods of applying it are pretty simple. It's either going to be some form of green waste, um, it's going to be put down, it's going to be some form of a, a biostimulant or a manure, it's going to be through uh, shales or humates, it's going to be through biochar, uh, wood waste, there's all of these different ways to sort of incorporate carbon. It doesn't really cost you anything as an operator extra to do that. In fact, most fertilizer blenders will give you options on how to get carbon materials into your fertilizer already. Now, obviously you can come see me, but every place that you do currently can do something like this to get the carbon in the soil. And here are the benefits, and I am rushing because I, I know we had a little short time. Um, the biggest noticeable difference, and if you walk around and you're out on the floor and you visit some of the booths where you're seeing that word, or you're seeing char, or you're seeing humic, or you're seeing things like that, this soil building, enhanced nutrient uptake for the plant. Enhanced nutrient uptake. The nitrogen and carbon work extremely well together. They bond together, carbon will hold it, it will release sort of just as a sponge in the soil. What that allows is for a more enhanced fertility aspect where you don't have to put as much down because you now have something functioning in the soil to hold and slowly release. The two together work as a slow release unit, naturally. If you have soil high in organic matter, high carbon content, your productivity of that soil is much greater. When you do apply nutrients, you see a greater and more long-lasting result, okay? One of the greatest depletions we've seen over time in lawn care, and you guys can think about this throughout now, applications you've done and places that you're seeing, compaction is way worse than it's ever been because we see less and less organic matter in the soil. A lot of these techniques on modern fertility have been forced us in, into our minds to grow taller grass, faster grass, not deeper roots. And the roots are what are truly giving that softening of the soil and adding the carbon back in. It's the under the soil work that we're missing. <clears throat> truly, in our programs, that's really been the big miss. So by incorporating any of these materials, if you can start using this, this any carbon-based item along with your fertility, you're going to see and physically feel the soil looser, less disease pressure. There's a multitude of items that kind of go along with it. Now, as that little bead falls off that grass, that is exactly 15 minutes. I promised I wouldn't go over that. So, I'm gonna be here for a little bit if anybody has any questions for me, but I'm gonna go ahead and wrap it right there. And uh, I think we're done, right? That's it. Yeah. Done? All right. Thank you.